Okay, 6.1, 6.6, .6, finally here in Unit 6, talking about heat. Enduring understanding, changes in a substance properties or change in different substance requires an exchange of energy. So what are we going to do here? We're going to learn about system and surroundings for physical and chemical processes. Identify those. Identify change in energy of a system as being endo or exothermic. And calculate the heat in Q absorbed or released by system undergoing a chemical reaction in relationship to the reacting substance in moles and the molar enthalpy. So that's basically stoic with heat in it. That's what we're saying. Stoic with heat in it. All right. But let's identify some terms here before we get to those calculations. Like energy. What is energy? Energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. Energy used to... Uh, Used to cause an object that has mass to move is called work. So work is defined, our uh, equation is force times distance. And energy used to cause the temperature of an object to rise is called heat. So a couple different factors here, because we're checking, looking at the overall energy of the system. And we will eventually whittle that down through some derivations into just delta H, the heat of reaction. Okay. So capacity to work or to produce heat. We also must abide by the law of conservation of energy. Energy can be converted from one form to another, but it is neither created nor destroyed. This is due to the fact that the total energy of content of the universe is constant. So we have our total energy in the universe. It can change forms, but it's not created nor destroyed. It just exists. But the, the transformation, and there's a bunch of different types of energy, and the main one, of course, we're gonna be looking at for this particular unit is heat transfer. So that's thermal energy. Like later on, when we get to electrochemistry, then that's going to be electrical chemistry. And you'll see flows of electrons, and that would be the, the exchange there to produce electricity. All right, kinetic energy is the energy of moving particles, right? Energy due to motion of the object depends on the mass of the object and its velocity. So the equation to calculate kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Now, m is mass, v is velocity. This is mainly a physics equation. We do discuss it when we get to gas laws because we talk about comparing different gases with different masses. So if they're at the same temperature, they have the same kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. If one gas is moving faster than the, um, the other, that means it must be smaller in terms of mass and, and vice versa. So we do look at this equation later on when we get to gas laws, but we'll, we'll hit to that later on. The, the other one that's important, I think more, more in particular to this unit is potential energy. Because potential energy is mechanical energy, stored energy, or the energy caused by its position. In chemistry, potential energy refers to stored energy too. So the net electrical charge, that's gonna be what you see in electrochemistry. But for our particular unit right now, the main area is gonna be that the stored energy is found in the chemical bonds. So we're not really going for the physics definition where the rider was going down the hill where of course, their kinetic energy is increasing because they're moving faster, but their potential energy decreases because now they're moving down the hill. Here, our main focus, especially in terms of heat exchange, is going to be about bond breaking and bond forming, and that involves stored energy in those bonds. So we're going to be looking at that potential energy. Kinetic energy, we will, re like I said, revisit when we get to gas laws. All right, so energy units. The joule. And as you can see, it's a derived unit. One kilogram per meter squared over second squared. And the guy's name's Joule. He 
was able to establish that relationship. The non-SI unit widespreadly used is the calorie. We use it here. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. And significantly enough, one calorie and 4.184 joules, those are both the specific heats of water, okay? And so that's an easy way to remember them because one gram uh, or one joule per gram degree Celsius, or I'm sorry, no, one calorie per gram degree Celsius is going to be for water and then 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius is the specific heat of water. Yes? What does the one do, like in the joules equation, like that's multiplying by that fraction, what, is, what does it do? Well, it's just like one kilogram times meter squared over second squared. Oh. It's just showing you like measured values to where you could calculate the joule because it's the mass times the distance over the time squared or the distance squared over the time squared. But for our purposes, we're just going to be using the joule form of it. But in physics, you might see it where you might have to derive it out or so forth. I don't know. All right, the system. System includes molecules we want to study. The surroundings are everything else around it. So in this diagram here, we have a piston that's holding gas particles inside. The gas particles are oxygen and hydrogen. So the system is really just the oxygen and hydrogen. The piston, the outside, the container, all that other stuff is what we classify as surroundings. Okay? Now, before we continue on, we're going to talk about heat flow. Heat always flows from warmer objects to colder objects in that direction of exchange. So, I like to use the idea of when I put my hand on the board, my hand feels cold. And if I'm declaring my hand to be the system here, not the board, my hand being the system, the heat is leaving my hand and going into the board, okay? If the board was the system, the board would be considered as absorbing the heat, okay? Now, I could leave it up here, and eventually, a couple of minutes, we'll reach thermal equilibrium and be at the same temperature. However, I'm not going to do that, but heat fl always flows from the warmer object to the colder object. That's why me being the warmer object, since heat is leaving my hand, that's why it feels cold to me. Study of energy and its inner conversions is called thermodynamics. Now, in this particular part of thermo, unit six, it's called thermo part one because we're touching on part one of it. We will be addressing the first law, which happens to be conservation of energy. So the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, we'll be hitting the second and third law later on in thermo part two when we get start talking about entropy. But for this section, it's all about heat and delta H. Now, energy is neither created nor destroyed. So what does that mean in terms of system and surroundings? In other words, the energy of the universe is constant. So if the system is losing energy, that means the surroundings are gaining the energy. It's equal in magnitude, vice versa, okay? So here, if I'm looking at this part, energy lost to the surroundings, because here was the initial state, here's the final state. That amount of energy here that left the system now went to the surroundings. Over here, energy gained from the surroundings. That means from here to here that the system's absorbing that energy, this magnitude of energy the surroundings are losing that same exact amount, okay? All right, so 
By definition, the change in internal energy, or delta E, is the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system. And you're going to see lots of delta equations now, because we do lots of change of. So here's going to be the final state minus the initial state. What you should notice, too, is energy lost to the surroundings. It gives it a negative sign. Energy is being released from the system to the surroundings. Or energy is gained by the system, that means delta E is going to be positive because it's being absorbed into the system. So this particular system here, this graph is showing me that H2 plus O2 is giving me H2O. Like so I can balance the equation and whatever. Initially, I have my reactants up here, which are starting at a higher energy. Okay, when we go to make the product over here, the bonds of the water are at a much lower energy state. So, whatever this was in between that number, that magnitude of energy, was released to the surrounding. That also means that the stored energy in the bonds of the reactants is a higher amount than the energy that remains in the product's bonds when you're done. Okay? So it becomes this whole net gain or net loss of energy. If you, if you get what I mean in terms of the net. Because in every chemical re reaction you have bonds breaking and we know by definition that takes energy so that's endothermic and we have bonds forming that's releasing energy, but it's going to be the net effect between the two that gives you your actual amount that is either leaving the system or being gained by the system. All right, internal energy can also be written as Q plus W. That means heat plus work. You can measure those things, stick it in there, and find your change in internal energy as well if you don't know the final and initial states of the energy to begin with you can still calculate it well what does that mean to us so when heat is added to a system and work is done on the system the internal energy increases those are both positive effects to get providing energy to go into the system heat is lost or work is done by the system the internal energy decreases so that means it's being lost now, once again, if you have like heat being added, but work is being done, where you have the contrary uh, variables here, it's going to be whichever one is higher that determines whether delta E is positive or negative. Same thing goes with if heat is being lost and work is being done on the system, whichever one's higher out of those two would result in which way the sign's going to be. All right. Endo versus exo. When heat is absorbed by the system, the process is endothermic. So we're going to frame this in terms of chemical reactions and also physical processes like phase changes. So in chemical reactions, we have bonds breaking and bonds forming to make new substances. What does that mean? That means the bonds energy, the bond breaking energy is higher than the bond forming energy. So it takes more energy to break the bonds than the energy that is released. So it's going to result in a positive delta H. Now, one thing you have to remember when you're talking about chemical reactions, you measure the temperature with a thermometer or temperature probe. And the thermometer is always, like us, because we're observers, we're always from the surroundings perspective. So if this is an endothermic reaction, this temperature probe over here would have started out at about room temperature before it was put into the reaction. And room temperature is about 22 to 25 degrees Celsius. But as you can see, once it was put into this reaction, it dropped down to 9 degrees Celsius. And that seems like it doesn't work. But what you have to think of is the temperature probe here is from the surroundings perspective. If it's endothermic, the system is gaining the heat. 
So it is removing heat from the surroundings in that process. So the thermometer or the temperature probe being in the surroundings, it's going to feel cold to it since it's taking heat away from the thermometer. Does that make sense? Everybody always misses this. Not everybody, but this is a highly shown mistake on tests where people forget that if the temperature decreases, you combine something and the temperature goes down, it is endothermic, okay? This is for chemical reactions, of course. So anytime you dump things together and you get new substances, you have chemical change and the temperature decreases, it should be endothermic because the thermometer is losing energy to the system. It's in the surroundings. Potential energy diagram. And we'll look at these again, but just the basic construct. Remember you have the bond energy of the reactants over here. You have the bond energy of the products over here. What you should notice is the amount in the reactants is lower than that in the products. So when the bonds break and the bonds reform, you have a net change here of this much energy, that's the delta H. It's going to be positive too, a positive delta H, because if you're starting at lower energy and then eventually end up at higher energy in the bonds, it had to suck the energy from somewhere and it does from the surroundings, it takes it from the surroundings. Okay? So delta H is going to be positive, it's the net change from the final minus initial. Now talking about phase changes, the endothermic phase changes. When we're talking about endothermic phase changes, we're talking about melting and vaporization and sublimation. The reason why all of these will fall under endothermic is because they all require energy to overcome the forces that are holding the particles together. And you know this based off of the heating curve because when it's melting, it's flat. Temperature's not increasing. When it's vaporizing, it's flat. If the increased temperature was being used to make the particles move faster, it would be on one of the slope sections. As the kinetic energy increases with temperature, average kinetic energy, the particles are moving faster. But here, if it's flat, the temperature's not changing. That's because all the heat that's going in there is going to overcome forces. It's not being used to make the particles move faster. And that's going to go with melting, vaporization, and sublimation. Okay? Now, exothermic, by definition, operational definition of exothermic, the heat's being released from the system to the surroundings. In chemical reactions, you still have the bond breaking, bond forming, but the bond breaking energy or the bond energy of the reactants is going to be lower than the bond's energy. No, the bond breaking energy is lower than the bond's forming energy. And if you remember from previous notes, we say axing is taxing, so that's bond breaking, forming is warming. That means it's releasing energy. The amount of energy being released is higher than that that's being absorbed. And the thermometer, once again, being from the surroundings for exothermic reactions, the temperature always increases. It feels warm because we're sitting in the surroundings, so we feel the warmth since the energy is being released to us. Same thing goes for the thermometer. Now, the potential energy diagram. The only thing that's really changed is the bond energies of the reactants and products. Here, bond energies higher to start with. Bond energies end up being lower because this amount of energy in between is what is being released to the surroundings. Now, that means, of course, too, that delta H is going to be negative in this particular case. The heat 
being released to the surroundings. And the negative sign shows it's going to the surroundings. Positive sign means it's going into the system. So the signs do matter. All right, interparticle attractions form to pull particles together in phase changes that are exothermic processes. And if you really think about it, like changing a gas back into a liquid doing condensation, the gas particles are slowing down and being pulled together. And they're reestablishing some IMFs. In that process, what happens to some of that kinetic energy? It gets released, okay? You're forming IMFs. So forming is warming here, forming IMFs. Energy is being released. You're also slowing down those particles. So where is that some of that? energy going to to the surroundings okay and you can see it on the cooling curve same thing plateaus condensation it's flat because the energy is being used or the the slowing down process and forming there that all occurs at the same temperature and freezing of course same idea here the and the difference is you're forming some forces in liquid from gas to liquid and then when you're going from liquid to solid, remember, it's forming the stronger forces that hold them in fixed position. So they can only vibrate. So try to reframe the endo-exothermic ideas around two categories. What does it look like under chemical reactions? What does it look like under phase changes? And try to keep them separated, because then you'll get confused if you don't. Although they basically do follow the operational definitions of is the energy being released from the system or is the energy being absorbed by the system? And that's really where you should start with. That should be square one, starting with is it released or absorbed? All right, so first question here. Is freezing of water endo or exothermic? Is the freezing of water endo or exothermic process? Exothermic. exothermic. Now, how do we explain this? Bonds forming. Not bonds, but stuff. Like specifically. Wait, it's not bonds? Then what is what is the ice? It's like intermolecular forces. So technically, the hydrogen bonds, which is a type of intermolecular force forming between the liquid water molecules and we know that forming releases energy we say forming is warming now of course you can't write forming is warming on your paper but you at least know that direction here so here's a reasonable explanation endothermic process ex i'm sorry exothermic process because you must remove energy in order to slow down molecules and form interparticle attractions mainly hydrogen bonds, because that's the predominant one there, to form the solid. So that is a releasing energy process. Yes? Do you have to talk about the inner particle attractions, or can you just say that the kinetic energy decreases? Well, you can say that, but why are the kinetic energy decreasing? Because they're being pulled together by the forces. So yes, when you're talking about phase changes, you really should be addressing the forces. Mm -hmm. When we're talking chemical reactions, it's breaking bonds and forming bonds. When we're talking phase changes, you're addressing whether you're overcoming forces or whether the forces are being reestablished. 